Well, what does it take to enter into the family of God? What does it take to be a Christian? What does it take to be saved? What does it take to get to heaven? What does it cost? You know, even the Bible would encourage us to count the costs, to make sure we're willing to give everything it takes in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, to make Jesus our king, to make our citizenry not of this world, but rather to be citizens of heaven. And so that's one of the reasons the passage that we're going to read today is so compelling and so challenging. When you think about the thief on the cross and what he had to give, what little he had to offer for him to experience salvation, the same salvation that you and I have, who maybe feel like we've given up so much. Let's just read this passage from Luke, and then let's think about what the Bible says it costs us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Luke 23, starting in 39, one of the criminals who was hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's just it. That was it. Not even a deathbed confession, but, but in the middle of being executed for his actual sins, his own admission, getting what he deserved, just one sentence, and Jesus said, you're saved. You know, it hardly seems fair. You know, you think about the Old Testament and, and it took the mark of circumcision, right? It took actually becoming an Israelite. You had to, to convert your nationality in order to be one of God's people. You think about what it cost people in the New Testament. Jesus saying, if you're going to come after me, you have to die to yourself. You have to repent. You have to give everything up if you're going to follow me. You think about the disciples. The disciples... Man, they had to give up their occupations, most of them. They went from a fisherman to a fisher of men, Matthew, getting up from his tax collector booth, leaving behind a career that he had no doubt built that included wealth and prosperity and all of that. And you think about the rich young ruler coming to Jesus and saying, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus saying, oh, you have to go and sell everything you have and give it all to the poor. Man, it seems like it cost people an awful lot to enter in to the kingdom of heaven, to become a disciple, to, to, to enter into the family of God. And yet, here's this person who simply says, Jesus, remember me. And Jesus says, oh, today you'll be with me in paradise. You know, the church has had a lot of interesting ideas, different ideas about what it means to enter into the church, to become a member of the church, or, or to, to um, be in the family of God. Some traditions would say, oh, you know, we, we send people through catechism. It's after they learn a certain amount and can pass a certain kind of test where they understand fully the gospel and they understand fully the, the traditions of our faith and, and, and what the Bible teaches. That's when somebody enters into being the, in the family of God. Or, or some people would say, no, we're actually looking for a time when somebody maybe through some training enters into a, a time where they can have their first communion. And it's that when you fully are able to, to receive communion with the, the family of God, that you're a full-fledged member of the family of God. Or, or other people have said, no, it's actually baptism. It's not till you enter the waters of baptism that you actually are a member of the family of God. And, and yet you look at the thief on the cross, he had no opportunity for any of these things. I, I don't know if he had any desire for any of these things. And instead, all he had was very little breath left in his lungs. Jesus, will you remember me when you enter into your kingdom? And maybe the last thing he ever heard was Jesus saying, man, today you can trust me. You'll be with me. In paradise. So what is it? What does it take to enter the kingdom of God?
Michael Heiser, the Bible scholar, I appreciate a lot. He, he describes it like this. He says, what it means to have faith, saving faith, is believing loyalty. That your whole heart, your whole life is loyal. And by belief, when we're talking about Jesus, we never just mean something we think. It's mean placing our trust, living in accordance with what we think. And so what it means to, to really convert to being a follower of Jesus is to put your believing loyalty. I no longer trust the things of this world. I no longer trust myself. Instead, I'm simply trusting the cross. I'm simply trusting Jesus to make a future for me. And you know, the truth is what it costs to enter into the kingdom of God is everything. Everything you've got. And if you have a lot, then it costs all of it. And if you have little, it costs all of it. And if you have a lot of time left, it costs all of it. And if you have a little time left, it costs all of it. Whether you're the rich young ruler or whether you're one of the disciples or whether you're the thief on the cross with just moments to live, what it costs you and I to enter into the kingdom of God is everything. But I'll tell you, I don't think the thief on the cross won. I don't think it was that he gave his life to Christ at the very end, and so somehow he, 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 he won the contest, and because he gave the least amount to Jesus, he ended up with the best deal. I bet that thief on the cross wishes he could go back to childhood and give Jesus his whole life. I bet if he just had one extra day, if he could go the day before he was condemned and crucified and say, oh, if I had just one more day, I would give it to Jesus. See, the truth is, we live better lives with hope and joy. We don't give everything to Jesus and find that we have lost anything. We give everything to Jesus and find that we have gained everything. I don't think the thief on the cross feels like in God's economy, he was the, the winner, the one with the best investment because he gave the least in order to enter into the kingdom of God. I bet he wished he could go back and give his entire life. What do you have? What would you lose to give it all to Jesus? Instead of waiting for a deathbed confession, instead of sowing all the wild oats, instead of gathering into your barns all that you could possibly gather, instead of that, why don't we now look at Jesus on the cross and say, maybe I should stop asking about what it cost me and I should start asking what it cost him. That Jesus requires that I give everything, but what did he give? Certainly more than I have. So whether you have a lot or a little, whether you have a lot of time left or little time left, today is the day to give it all to Christ and to find that in giving everything to him, you've not lost anything. Rather, you have gained your soul. You have gained eternity. And Christian, instead of, of looking at jealousy with the world, why don't we revel joyously and the idea that we have trusted Jesus with our whole lives. And in return, he has given us himself. And if you feel like that thief on the cross, that you don't have much to give, would you know today that all it takes is a simple cry? The thief on the cross didn't have much to give, but he was able to acknowledge his own sin. He said, I'm, I'm here because I'm a sinner. He was able to turn and look at Jesus and see Jesus for who he was. And he was able to cry out with his last breath, Jesus, would you save me? If you have more than one breath left, praise the Lord. But even if you have one breath left, would you use it to say, Jesus, would you remember me?